Blizzard used to be the king of gaming and everything they touched was gold. But in the past 10 years, Blizzard has been in decline and the people who once made it great left one by one. The product genius that brought them to, the, to that monopolistic position gets rotted out. What drove them away from the company they loved? Where did they end up? Let's take a look starting with Ben Brode. Now, Ben made a massive impact in his 15 years with Blizzard. Starting out as a tester for Warcraft, he eventually became the director of Hearthstone. But he wasn't just a director. He was the touch point between fans and Blizzard. And those fans absolutely loved him. Yeah, this is awesome. He brought so much fun to every video he was in, and he felt like someone who just loved Hearthstone. But in 2018, just three years later, he would resign from Blizzard altogether. Yesterday, Ben Brode announced he was leaving Hearthstone. A similar case to Ben is Jeff Kaplan. Just like how Ben was the face of Hearthstone, Jeff was the face of Overwatch. Despite being the vice president of a multi-billion dollar company, he felt like this passionate developer, always there to talk to fans in forums or in videos about the game's development. And of course, was subject to many memes. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful developer on the Overwatch team. But much to the dismay of fans, Jeff resigned in 2021, after being with Blizzard for close to 20 years. Rob Pardo followed the same path. Rob was the original lead designer of both WoW and Warcraft 3, and eventually became the chief creative officer. His accomplishments and contributions were so notable that he was in Times Magazine top 100 most influential people in 2006. But Rob resigned, like the rest, leaving in 2014. The list of veteran talent goes on. Wei Wang, an incredible artist who produced iconic pieces for Warcraft games, departed in 2017. Brian Birmingham, a lead software engineer on World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, and WoW Classic, left after 17 years. Scott Mercer, who worked on the original Starcraft, WoW, and Overwatch, left in 2023 after 26 years. Tim Morton, the lead producer of StarCraft II, left in 2020. Frank Pierce, one of the Blizzard co-founders and the executive producer of all these World of Warcraft expansions, left in 2019 after 28 years. This isn't even a fraction of the list. And sadly, this trend is continuing. Recently, the president of Blizzard resigned as Microsoft announced 1,900 layoffs. Shake up on the leadership front with Blizzard president Mike Yabara deciding to leave the company. Blizzard was founded and maintained by these incredible people. People who were great at their job, but more importantly, loved their job. These games had passion behind every one of them, thanks to the hardworking teams. But now, the people and passion are gone. To give you perspective on how fast things have fallen apart, at the 2016 BlizzCon, five senior members celebrated 25 years of Blizzard together. Today, only one of them is still at the company, with Alan Adham being the most recent casualty. Now, many people cite the death of Blizzard to Activision, believing the merger between these two companies, along with King, cemented the fact that the studio was no longer just a bunch of game developers, but a corporate conglomerate. While this may be true, this isn't the full story. For one, Activision and Blizzard didn't technically merge at all. In fact, Blizzard has never been an independent company. As far back as 1994, before the first Warcraft, Blizzard was acquired by Davidson and Associates for less than $7 million, before they were even called Blizzard. Then Davidson was acquired by CUC International in 1996. Then CUC merged with another company to form Sendent a year later, who then sold Blizzard to another company, Havas, the following year, who was then acquired by Vivendi that same year. Confusing? Absolutely. But it shows us what really happened. Blizzard has been at the mercy of their parent companies for decades. But luckily, they were able to retain their culture and talent through it all. But that was about to change. In 2008, Activision merged with Vivendi Games. But they opted to call the new merger Activision Blizzard. Not Activision or Activision Vivendi. Activision Blizzard. Blizzard was just a subsidiary at the time, so why call it that? Well, even though the company was sold over and over, the company had expanded from a small studio to a globally recognized brand. A brand created by a team of passionate and talented developers. And this brand's value had grown from a few million dollars into billions, and people were taking notice. That's why the merger was called Activision Blizzard, and why it even happened in the first place. They had an incredible reputation incredible games, and incredible people. So you might be thinking, screw Activision. How did they do this to our beloved Blizzard? 
But you need to remember, this merger happened in 2008. Back then, Activision had a very different reputation. One, pretty similar to Blizzard, and being acquired was nothing new for the company. But one person would change all of that. The main person orchestrating the billion dollar merger, Bobby Kotick. Now, Bobby Kotick was excellent at improving a company's revenue. He purchased a nearly bankrupt Activision and turned it into one of the most lucrative companies in the industry. However, Bobby Kotick's approach to profitability was quite different to Blizzard's and many other video game publisher CEOs at the time. You know how every game today feels like a sequel, reboot, or a spinoff? Yeah, we can thank Bobby Dick. Excuse me. Kodik for that. Bobby's perspective on video games was one entirely focused on revenue. While revenue is vital, Moby Kodik took it to another level. Our strategy has been to focus on the products that we know if we release today, we'll be working on 10 years from now. Narrow and deep has been essential in our strategy of how you expand operating margins. Narrow and deep in expanding profit margins. So Bobby's plan was to squeeze their IPs for everything they had. And he was determined to ramp up this strategy not only with Activision, but with Blizzard. He saw their IPs as the perfect product to do this. Games that people would play decade after decade. So if good old Bobby D couldn't run a game into the ground, he didn't want it. Beating a dead horse to the extreme. That feels good, very strong. Sorry, Thunder, I gotta put you down. But his strategy did work for a while. Activision Blizzard quickly went from big to ginormous. By 2014, it was the fifth largest gaming company in the world by revenue. Soon enough, they became independent again by purchasing back the shares from Vivendi. So why does this matter? Well, because it begins to show us the real problem with Blizzard. Bobby Kadick was excellent at generating money, but his narrow and deep strategy had long-term consequences that took years to appear. While things didn't change much at first, the approach to game development slowly trickled down to every part of the company, including the employees. Teams across the company were no longer encouraged and rewarded for quality, but instead were punished for lack of output. Executives began making managers rank their employees based on output, not quality. While it's normal for team leaders to improve productivity, the stack ranking quota required that at least 5% of the staff be labeled developing, which really just means poor performance, meaning lower bonuses, fewer pay raises, and fewer promotions. It didn't matter if 100% of the team was producing great work, some of them had to suffer. And that brings us to Brian Birmingham. Brian, like many lead developers, had been dodging these quotas for years, but he couldn't outrun them forever. Upper management forced him to label some employees as underperforming. The reason given by executive leadership was that it was important to squeeze the bottom most performers as a way to make sure everybody continues to grow. But in reality, growth just means output, which brings all kinds of terrible consequences. This sort of policy encourages competition between employees, causes people to sabotage one another's work, not to mention it ultimately erodes trust and destroys creativity. Brian refused, and unless the policy would be removed, he threatened to leave Blizzard. Unfortunately, his demands weren't met, and it cost him his job of 17 years. Fans were outraged, but Brian's case is just one of many. This has been happening at Blizzard for a while now. Blizzard didn't go from great to terrible in a day, but little by little, their culture gradually eroded, and so did their pool of talent. That's why so many incredible developers have left. But from Bobby Kotick's perspective, this was fine. Because another reason his narrow and deep strategy was so successful was because it was easy to attract developers and pay them below market wage thanks to the popularity of the Blizzard IP. So talent became a replenishable resource. Bobby Beluga once said publicly that his goal was to take all the fun out of making video games and that the company's employees incentive program really rewards profit and nothing else. Both of these things make for better business, nope. but is why Activision Blizzard is in the state that they're in. They stopped valuing talent and started valuing output, which is why every game is over monetized and why everyone who helped build Blizzard is gone. The issue wasn't that Activision Blizzard was run by business people, as many people like to say. The issue was leadership didn't care. They didn't see Warcraft, Overwatch, or Diablo as video games or art, but as IP to be exploited. To put it in perspective, Blizzard's founder and former CEO, Mike Morhaim, made $12 million the year he left. Sounds like a lot, until you compare it to Bobby's, who is speculated to make $375 million following the Microsoft acquisition, on top of all the millions he's made in the past. Bobby Calamari was there to make Blizzard successful in the short term, because that's what made him the most money. 
But if you're a good CEO, being successful isn't just making money for the company. It means building products people will love and building a company that will outlast you once you're gone. So the people that can make the company more successful are sales and marketing people. And they end up running the companies. And the product people get driven out of the decision-making forums. And the companies forget what it means to make great products. It sort of the product sensibility and the, the product genius that brought them to, the, to that monopolistic position gets rotted out by people running these companies who have no conception of a good product versus a bad product. They have no conception of the craftsmanship that's required to take a good idea and turn it into a good product. And they really have no feeling in their hearts usually about wanting to really help the customers. That brings me to my main point. Blizzard isn't the company. It was the people. People like Rob, Mike, Ben, Jeff, Tim, and so many more. People who built Blizzard because they wanted to make games everyone loved. Blizzard is a company of gamers. We love our games and we play our games and we want to continue to support them as long as we possibly can. We're definitely focused on quality first and foremost. Quality is the secret ingredient to fun. This seems like a wildly different company to the Blizzard of today, but it's the Blizzard I loved from my youth. So where are these people now? Where did the people that built Blizzard go? Well, these beloved developers are all scattered, split up at companies around the world making great games like Stormgate. Because a storm's coming. This sci-fi RTS just raised shy of $2 million on Kickstarter, about 20 times its original goal, with me being a happy contributor. The reason, it's awesome. This game is dripping with classic Blizzard charm because it's literally a game made by the seasoned Blizzard developers who made the RTS games we love. People like Tim Morton, the production director on StarCraft II, and Tim Campbell, a lead campaign designer of Warcraft 3. These guys are the RTS experts. And what's crazy is that they got some talent. Their team is jam-packed with people who came from Blizzard, most of which worked on StarCraft and Warcraft for years. This is where Blizzard went. Almost all these people who made Blizzard great are still doing the same thing, making games they and others love. Ben Brode, the face of Hearthstone, founded his own studio, Second Dinner, and made his own award-winning card game, Marvel Snap. Rob Pardo founded Bonfire Studios and recruited many seasoned Blizzard developers. Chris Kalecki did the same thing, founding Notorious Studios with another Blizzard employee, with most of the current employees having worked on WoW, Hearthstone, and Overwatch. Brian Birmingham founded Unleashed Games, who worked on everything from Hearthstone to the original WoW. Even Mike Morhaime, Blizzard's original longtime CEO, has founded his own development and publishing company, Dreamhaven, and he brought many of Blizzard's veterans with him. Blizzard isn't the company, it's the people. The real Blizzard is all over the gaming industry, creating new, innovative games they want to make with a great culture. The icing on the cake is that most of these studios immediately got millions in funding because investors know how valuable their experience is. It's baffling how little Activision Blizzard cared for their talent, and they'll pay for it for decades. This is an example of a studio getting too big for its britches and forgetting the passion they once had. If you're feeling nostalgic over the golden age, I encourage you to follow the same developers that created it. They're still out there, most of them creating new and novel experiences, returning the focus back from giant profit margins and terrible work culture to creating art and valuing talent. The only exception is Jeff Kaplan, the beloved face of Overwatch, who has somehow disappeared since leaving Blizzard. But if you were to follow the same path as his peers, there's no doubt Overwatch fans would flock to whatever he creates. Support these talented individuals, embrace their new endeavors. The real Blizzard we all love is still making games. They're just in different places. Plus with Activision Blizzard being acquired by Microsoft and Bobby Kotick finally leaving the mantle of CEO behind, there might be some hope for the company. They aren't starting off great with all the layoffs and they've been slowly killing some of our favorite franchises like Overwatch, but a man can hope. My goal with going indie is to help people learn more about the business of video games. I've covered a lot of topics from VR to free to play models. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to be notified when we post our next video. Thanks for watching, see you later.